Good afternoon. I want to extend uh, I want to extend a warm welcome to those of you that are here at the museum and those of you that are watching at home. This is our opportunity to report to you on the work of the museum of the past year, recognize our outgoing board members, introduce our new board members, and share the year-end financial report. And in addition, the staff has prepared a special presentation that I think you will enjoy. But first, I want to recognize uh, those staff members. I want to express appreciation for the museum staff, led by Director Andy Schmidt Andrus. Thanks to Andy for her determined leadership, to Chuck Regeer, Master of Exhibit Design and Development and Man of Many Talents, Dave Kreider, Collections Coordinator and another man of many talents, Kristen Schmidt, whose title of museum assistant does not begin to describe her duties, among them bookkeeping and the museum store. And Austin Prouty, a recent addition to the staff who has proved himself as a design assistant, social media expert, and possessor of a variety of other talents. So thank you to the staff. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce the members of the Association Board of Directors, uh, at least uh, to tell you who they are. They are not all able to be with us today. It is a great honor for me to serve with these dedicated people. Kendra Berkey, Barbara Bunting, Marianne Eichelberger, Steve Friesen, Julian Gonzalez-Salamanca, Jenny Macias, Johan Reimer, and Cindy Weeds. Brad Coleman, who is the Bethel College Vice President for Advancement, serves as the college's liaison to the museum board in an ex officio capacity. Now, on behalf of the board, I want to extend tremendous thanks to three persons who have left the board after serving one or two terms. They are Rachel F. Bowler, Sandra Kuntz, and Katie Schmidt. The board will greatly miss these three women who have served with excellence. And I'm delighted to tell you about the election of four new board members. And uh, let me express my appreciation to the membership uh, for participating in the election of these new members and the continuing officers. Joining us on the board are Chris Conradi, native Newtonian and local business person, Deb Ham, known to many as the now former superintendent of the Newton School District. Christine Downey Schmidt, educator and former Kansas senator. And Linda Moyo, full time Bethel College student, holder of several part time service oriented jobs and entrepreneur. Linda is the first to hold the associate member position, which was created by the board this year. And uh, I also just want to uh, announce or remind you of the officers of the board for this coming year. Marianne Eichelberger will be serving as vice president, Cindy Weens as secretary, Barbara Bunting as member at large of the executive committee, and myself, Donna Becker, continuing another year as president. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Andy. Thank you, Donna. You do such a good job at that. And it's nice to uh, hear about the people that will be joining us on the board. We're so glad uh, to have them and also very grateful for those, for those that are going off um, and appreciate their service. We are going to start out the afternoon with a, a little bit of talk about finances. And there's one uh, slide on the screen, and it shows both last year's and this year's, I'll turn off the lights so you can perhaps see it better. And um, what I'll do first is go through last year's budget. So you, you can glance over at that yellow column, but really we're going to be talking about 
the second column from the right there. So that is last year's budget. Uh, as you look at it, you can see uh, we had a nice amount of gift income. We thank our members very much for that. Uh, we don't have the budgeted amount listed there, what we thought we would get, but uh, the estimate for that was actually $50,000. So right on the nose on that one. And then as you go through, you'll see some of the typical kinds of income uh, the, that grants and awards. Um, some of that is deposits from different grants that we receive throughout the year. And then one you'll especially notice, and it's significantly different than some other years, is that miscellaneous income. And we'll mention that again later. That is some of the money we received on from PPP, money through Bethel College. So that's an unusual income source for us. Going on down, you can see that uh, Let's see, we're still on, I you go back up to income. Uh, we're on uh, traveling exhibits did quite well this, this year, and the special events also did quite well, which we were very excited about given the fact that we had to change formats on those. So nice income there for special events. Of course, uh, admissions are down, and, and that's partly due to the fact that we have very few field trips at all in the last year. That sometimes accounts for a 2,500 to 3,000 in, um, in admissions right there. And then the museum store you can see is significantly down also. We were closed part of the time. We changed our sales due to COVID, things like that. But in the end, you can see we had a good, healthy total income of uh, 304,000. And then switching down to expenses, Last year, uh, uh, the personnel costs were down a bit, uh, partly because we changed uh, some positions. Becca Schrag uh, no longer was working for us after about January, so that went down a bit. And we also have not hired anyone in the capacity of the Curator of Education, which is what I was doing before I became director. And going on through, you can see operations, maintenance, those are all about what you'd expect them to be. Traveling exhibits came about, came out at just about where we expected it. Special events had many fewer expenses. With the uh, off-site uh, pickup meals that we had, uh, the expenses weren't nearly as great. And so that means in the end, taking income uh, minus expenses, special events did especially well. And you can see, too, that outside work income was quite good also. So in the end, we ended the year with $20,949. And uh, I'm going to read a summary that's written by Johan Reimer. And he and I formed the, the uh, finance committee. And I'll just read the statement from Johan, who could not be here today, but prepared a statement for the meeting. The museum ended the year with a surplus of 20949 This was certainly a welcome experience for us as a museum as the previous couple of years we ended with budget deficits. As you know, the main additional driver for the museum's financial success last year was the $43,000 in, in the PPP grant uh, from Bethel College. This was good news for us in an otherwise challenging year. The second biggest contributor to our financial success was traveling exhibits, which had a very strong financial year, bringing in 74,000 gross income. We expect traveling exhibit work to continue to be a very strong source of revenue for the museum. Overall, it was a very strong year for the museum. We need to take our bit of time to celebrate before rolling up our sleeves and getting to work on all our initiatives and plans for a successful 2021 2022 fiscal year. Okay, now if you look at the yellow column, uh, things go ahead just as you might expect. We've predicted income similar to other years in many categories. We are expecting uh, good income from the traveling exhibits, as I mentioned earlier, and a lot of that has been figured with spreadsheets that both uh, Chuck and Dave do as they look ahead and 
see which venues have reservations or have, have bookings placed for exhibits to travel in the next year. So those are pretty solid figures at this point. Feel good about that. And then, of course, special events. We're hoping the museum store goes up more this year and that we can have more live shopping. We're also hoping to introduce some online items this year. And you can see, uh, as we go down to expenses, personnel goes up a bit. We hope to hire a visitor services coordinator to take care of some of the duties that I was doing and then help in other, a variety of other ways around the museum. Other item expenses, you can see operations stays about the same, maintenance, uh, special exhibitions, we aren't expecting anything too big, and then traveling exhibit expenses, of course, go along with uh, uh, getting the income. You also have to get the exhibit, the exhibit to the spot where it's going. And as you work your way down, uh, you'll see expenses come out to be about 294000 So we have uh, situated ourselves right now, and the board passed the budget with a $30,000 deficit, and actually we're, uh, of course, uh, wanting to get rid of that deficit as soon as we can and work hard to do that throughout the year. Uh, but everyone felt supportive about that, and I will read Johan's statement about that. Our projected budget for 21-22 shows a $30,000 deficit, $30,700. This is not something the board or staff take lightly. We've decided to move forward with this deficit budget rather than make arbitrary and painful budget cuts or potentially exasperate uh, potentially exacerbate the budget shortage uh, by placing ideas on what might happen in different categories. We start this year with the deficit budget, but we hope to outperform this budget as the year goes along. Some cuts in expense may turn out to be achievable, but likely improving on budget performance will require revenue increases that we can't yet foresee. Uh, that's things such as uh, contract work and more exhibit reservations. We start this year with a realistic understanding of where we stand, but also with a sense of hope. Our budgetary performance in 2021 was very impressive, especially in a year so deeply impacted by the global COVID pandemic. We move forward into the next fiscal year with an understanding that as a museum community, we can continue to take on and overcome challenges. And I think I will pause before moving on and just uh, see if there are any questions for the from the folks that are here uh, watching with us today or any questions from anyone online. Okay, anything coming online there? I see a head shaking, not nodding. Okay, well, we will move ahead And let's see, Chuck, should I move ahead myself? Or, or you've got the zapper right there. Andy, I just thought of one thing. You might just say what PPP stands for. Okay, I was going to say it spontaneously. <laughs> I wasn't coming up with it. Hey, Chuck. Oh yeah, paycheck, pay, paycheck protection program, a, a federally uh, implemented grant to help businesses, nonprofits um, survive and flourish even during the pandemic. <clears throat> okay. A few things. Uh, some of your non-traditional slides in this program are going to be ways to just segue into a, into a topic we might be talking about. Of course, there were plenty of transitions. In a year of, year of the pandemic, uh, we often found ourselves needing to remake ourselves. If you're familiar with uh, Transformer toys, uh, 
this little guy, the little monster guy or superhero guy, whatever he is there on the right, uh, you can bend him and fold him and do all sorts of things and he turns into the car. So we, uh, during the pandemic, bended and folded and uh, turned into a museum that had outside exhibits and online programs, things that we hadn't done a lot of before. And I'm very excited how the museum could work through the pandemic. Of course, we were deciding initially, almost on a weekly basis, how we'd be open, when we'd be open, things like that, and eventually got into the swing of taking care of that. And I, I will make a comment here that this year's annual report sort of leaks backwards into the uh, year prior to it, because it does seem like that March of 2020 uh, up till June of 2020 just kind of flowed right into the rest of the pandemic year. So I might be uh, talking about some things that happened in the late part of the 2020 fiscal year. So changing times with the pandemic. We also, as referenced before, had, were very lucky to receive uh, different kinds of grants uh, through the government, the PPP, uh, payroll protection policy money that came in. Also, we received a Humanities Kansas CARES grant and a Harvey County CARES grant. More transitions uh, here on the floor at home. Uh, Becca Schrag in January of 20 uh, decided to resign from her position. She was working virtually with us from Kansas City. And meanwhile, back at the beginning of this fiscal year, Austin Prouty had joined us. So in January, Austin took over the responsibilities, many of which that um, Becca had been doing. So that's one change. Uh, also, in August of last year, the board and uh, executive committee offered me the position, uh, permanent position as a director. So I moved from interim director to director. And then another big transition that we made in this last year was this is the first year we have not received funds from Bethel College, a stipend, uh, which we've received for the last about 30 years. So another transition that was significant for us. Yes, Barbara. Would you be able to share the amount of that? The PPP money? The loss of income. Uh, that was usually, it, yeah, it's in our budget, every, has been in our budget. It was usually $25,000. Mm -hmm. So the last year we received, received that would have been the 2019-2020 fiscal year. And then this last year was 2020-2021, and we did not get that stipend from Bethel, although we're very, very happy that we were included in their PPP grant. Okay, next up... Um, one thing that sustained, sustained us during the year and continues to sustain us is collaborations. Uh, you can see, uh, this is another version of collaborations, the chicken and the puppies. You know, it's a funny scene where there are puppies under a chicken, but clearly uh, the puppies are getting something out of that relationship, the warmth of a nice, uh, nice uh, cuddly mother, and of course the chicken is fulfilling a maternal need that she has. She must be a broody hen and really need to sit on some eggs, but she only found puppies. So they're helping each other out, and numerous organizations helped us, or we worked together, uh, benefiting both organizations. And I'll just zip through some of these. We were lucky enough in January of 2021 to work with Tour Imagination, a group out of Canada, to create an online uh, virtual tour. Our part of this tour, and they would do a different organization uh, once every month. Ours was called On The Move, and we talked about many different ways that Kaufman Museum focuses on moving. We invited Reinhold uh, Jansen uh, to come be a part of that, and she talked about the movement of furniture, the movement of people in the immigrant furniture exhibit. We also have been working with Newton Public Library. This is back to our Transformers pictures that we had to transform and start doing some more outside 
uh, exhibits and collaborations. They're very happy with how this has worked out with Newton Public Library. Uh, right now there's a book called This is the Sunflower. About every six weeks we switch books. David Kreiner works with the, the library staff to switch out all the graphics and it's just been a really nice collaboration. Also a very nice um, way to interact with the public. It is just really fun to stand up in my office, look out the window, and there's a grandma and uh, her grandkids looking down at the signs and reading them. And, and that's not an uncommon sight. So uh, it's a really uh, satisfying project. Okay, another uh, group that we collaborated with, I've mentioned them already in terms of the Humanities Kansas Cares Act that we uh, got money through that grant program. And then Humanities Kansas has just been invaluable this year. They have approached us sometimes about working with them. We've applied for different grants. It's just gone back and forth. This is a picture that represents a contract that we have with them to move exhibits around the state. So these crates hold an exhibit, in this case an exhibit called Crossroads. And our staff member, David Kreider, goes with these crates to at least six sites around the state. Uh, then the exhibit is there for six weeks, it's up. And then Dave goes back, helps with the help of volunteers and staff members, takes it down, moves it to the next location with the help of volunteers at the next site, puts it up, and then it stays there for six weeks. So, so the crates uh, are resting at Coffin Museum in this photo, but that represents uh, the contract that we have with Humanities Kansas to help move this Smithsonian exhibit around the state. Oh, and this is Jay. This is a speedy one. I sh I'm doing the controls, right, Chuck? Okay, so this is Dave putting up the exhibit. If you recognize it, it's at Kaufman Museum. But just pretend this is any site in Kansas, a library, a museum. Working with local volunteers. And then we also collaborated this year with Humanities Kansas as a host site. So usually Dave is moving these exhibits around and we actually don't see them here at our site, but we applied and we became a host site for the exhibit. So we were one of the six sites. And this is the Crossroads exhibit uh, produced by the Smithsonian and they provided um, Humanities Kansas speakers, lots of ideas on other kinds of programming to do. So we're very happy to be a partner with them. And a part of that um, agreement is that we would also create a companion exhibit. Dave did the bulk of that work. And you can see our uh, companion exhibit called Of Land and People is right there beginning on the side. And it went around the outside walls, then around the whole exhibit. It was a nice combination how the crossroads was in the middle, and then our of land and people exhibit was around the outside edges. And yet another way that we've interacted with Humanities Kansas is they asked whether our staff could come out up with some kind of interactive part um, to go with the crossroads exhibit outdoors. So this was all happening when the pandemic first started. They were anticipating everything started in, in August of 20. And so our staff, that would be Chuck and Dave at the time, came up with this idea for an outdoor, healthy, selfie, interactive that could go to each of the sites. So each site received one of these. We're a host site, so we have one. And it's an outdoors area with um, a place where you can give feedback, some information on exhibit panels, then a spot where you can take a healthy selfie. So you can take a picture of yourself um, in that Kansas, with that Kansas background. That's our very own staff member, Austin Prouty, taking his picture at the selfie, healthy selfie station. Okay, so another collaboration. Uh, Chuck worked hard all year uh, working with the city of North Newton. If you've been in North Newton, you've likely seen some of the welcome kiosks along the way. Uh, there are 
oh gosh, Chuck, three, three sites uh, as you're driving into North Newton that you can see structures like this. So design of the exhibit, working with contractors that produce the concrete signs, producing some of the acrylic signs that go with it. Uh, so that was a big project last year. And if you saw some of our uh, contracted work, outside work, it's listed on the budget, that would have been through the City of North Newton project. And you might mention also Revere Construction. The oh, in Revere Construction, we worked uh, extensively with them in creating these. So they were the fabricators. Uh, Chuck served as a designer and worked with Regeer and the city of North Newton, of course. Okay, we are also uh, in great debt to those who we've um, who we've been grant uh, received grant funds from this year. And this will go through pretty quickly, but again, the Humanities Kansas we received crossroad funds. The city of North Newton contributed to uh, celebrate Kansas Day. The North Newton Community Foundation contributed to Uncle Carl's camp, allowing us to pay for some of that staff time, but also pay for some of the equipment that we can now, uh, we can actually show our own videos in the, in the classroom where we have Uncle Carl's camp. Used to be we needed to drag them out here or the teachers needed to bring their very own video projectors. So we're excited that we can now provide that for the teachers that teach Uncle Carl's camp. Then we had a number of different institutions that supported the, the vapes exhibit, the Kansas Creative Arts Industry Commission, of course, NMC Health, and that was the first venue. The picture at the top of the screen is uh, the exhibit when it went up the first time, and that was at, Newton, uh, at NMC Health. Also at Cetera Shop here in Newton, it gave us one of their local giving grants. And then Butler Rural Electric Co-op uh, also was willing to contribute to the vapes exhibit. And we think of all of you and the public as collaborators also. So people that either attended Uncle Carl's camp, have contributed financially, supported us in many ways, hosted grandchildren that came to visit. Uh, we we're happy to have the public to collaborate with. We also offered other kinds of programming. This is an example of what we have online right now. You can go and find these videos on our YouTube station. They were, if I'm not mistaken, all produced during the pandemic. So you can go online and uh, see the programs. This is a group online watching a program. I believe this was on Kansas Day with yep, Glenn Edgar's up there in the top left corner. He was our speaker that day, one of our uh, best turnouts. It was on uh, FOSPA and the history of FOSPA. Okay, uh, coming to the end, we have to um, recognize our most significant collaborators, and that's you, the members of Kaufman Museum. We're so excited that uh, you can all be a part of this museum family, whether that's contributing by, by being a volunteer, by attending events, by supporting us uh, with monetary gifts. We're very glad that you are collaborating with us. And to offer a little bit more perspective on many things that have been happening here at the museum, uh, the staff are going to be giving uh, short presentations on areas where they have expertise, areas where they served in the last year. So we've got a little bit from Kristen Schmidt. Oh, and I forgot, I'm gonna introduce them all too. Kristen Schmidt, of course, Donna's done that a little bit, but Kristen Schmidt will be coming up first. She is our museum assistant. And then David Kreider, our museum technician, will be coming up. And then Chuck Regeer, curator of exhibits. And then we'll be visiting with Austin Prouty, exhibitions assistant uh, from his home in California. I think I have that in the right order. So I think Kristen is up first.
Okay. The maintenance of the outbuildings has been a concern. And as you can see, here's the Ratzel barn and the boat Unruh Fast House. The bay are in need of repair work and painting. And as you recall, with our recent membership renewal, there was the opportunity to also donate to the Paint the Outbuildings project. And I don't know if you noticed in the financial report that there was a line that showed over $4,600 was collected with this drive. And so in order to log the income and expense of this major maintenance and not deplete the collections fund or general operations, the idea came forth to create an account for the outbuildings, just like there is an account for the organ, which enabled its restoration in 2007, or with our collections fund, which enabled the purchase of mobile shelving for the care of the artifacts. So, working with Greg Dick in the Bethel College Business Office, the Heritage Farmstead Fund was created. So, at the close of the fiscal year, the designated money remains in the Heritage Farmstead account just like the organ money remains in that fund and collections money remains in that fund so that we can always be using it for those specific projects. So I don't know if there's any questions, but we're pretty excited about having this new fund that's gonna help take care of the outbuildings, which are artifacts, but take a whole lot more money maybe to manage, so having this fund will be great. Thank you. Yes? When will you begin the painting? I think we're looking at uh, 2022 because we still need to generate some more funds and we need to put out bids, determine how much can be done with volunteer labor so there's a bit of organization that needs to happen. Anything else? I'll be speaking uh, this afternoon in my role as collections coordinator, which is in addition to what I have been doing as a museum technician. Um, our collections here at the museum are central to the mission of Cop Museum. Of the more than 40,000 artifacts that we have, many can be viewed in our permanent exhibit, but most are in storage where they're available to researchers and for future exhibits. And it's a dynamic collection which continues to grow, and in this past year was particularly active in its growth. Donors uh, seem to have used their extra time at home to identify family objects that they wanted to bring to Coffee Museum. More than 40 donations came in during the year, which represented more than 200 um, individual objects. And all of these were evaluated by our collections committee, and were accepted based on their adherence to our um, collecting focus, which is Mennonite origins and immigration, the history of Bethel College, cultures which have a relationship to Mennonite missions and relief work, Mennonite church history, and life. Um, here on the cart, I'll share a few of the 200 items that have come in to give you a glimpse of what's new.
one of the exciting things is a collection of uh, Native American artifacts that were gathered just east of Bethel College along the Sand Creek. Evidence of human habitation in this area dating back as, as three, three to 8,000 years ago. We have a, some items um, similar to this in our collection, but this adds to that local Native American history of the land that we're on. The bulk of the items that came in the past year relate to Mennonite life in Prussia, Russia, and a subsequent immigration here to the, the Prairie States. And among these were wall clocks, furniture, cradles, uh, small um, chairs, a lot of textiles, uh, clothing, and other household items. A few, I few items I pulled out that are significant. A 1883 sampler that was done by 10-year-old Renata Voth in South Russia. And she subsequently immigrated to Kansas and descendants donated this uh, marvelous sampler, embroidery sampler, to the museum. Items here, uh, a doll cradle and horn sausage stuffers for filling sausages, magnifying glass, we have homemade leather um, sheath. This collection came in from a family that had previously donated one of our, our major immigrant chests that's featured in our Mennonite Immigrant Furniture Collection. So it represents a family decades later continue to add to items that they previous, previously donated. Here's one of the fine, we must have received 10 nightshirts over the past year from the 19th century, and here's a particularly nice example of a nightshirt that was made in the 18, um, by the 1870s, 1880s. This large book was a significant donation. It's a, um, effort an edition of the Martyr's Mirror. We have a traveling exhibit based on the Martyr's Mirror. This edition was printed here in, the, in colonial America in the 17, late 1740s, and at the time it was the largest book printed in colonial America. Um, I think no more than 1,200 copies were printed originally, this being one of them. We'll use it um, in programming around the Martyr's Mirror, um, it's, it's great to have an actual copy to show um, groups that come and experience that exhibit. We do have one in the exhibit, but this in a case, but this one we can get out and, and have it more hands on. Underneath here is it's kind of a fun object that came in a uh, slaw cutter. We have other slaw cutters in the exhibit, in our collection, but none quite this big, and none that came from the Christian, Kauf, Christian, Christian and Raina Kaufman family. Um, Christian is, was native of Mound Ridge, and we have one of his poppy seat cleaners that he invented, poppy seat threshing machine, already in our collection. So to get another artifact from that family to represent uh, Swiss Wallonian cultural life is, is awesome. During the past year, items from our collection were also used to augment uh, special exhibits. The Crossroads exhibit that Andy mentioned, we used uh, longhorns in that as well as Native American objects. We also used items from our nursing and medical collection to uh, do a display on campus celebrating hometown or healthcare heroes, those who are um, active during the pandemic, um, 
dealing with medical issues, but showing that Bethel's history in nursing education and, and um, training doctors. We also brought out of our primary storage critical um, campaign poster from the Young Key for Congress campaign and did a mini exhibit in the ad building. Yeah, I'm just saying to people, I, I figured we'd hand over to Jim to probably present that poster. And, and I brought this out as an example before I knew that Jim was in the audience today. <laughs> what is it? It's designed by Bob Revere. Yes, he, he did, was a designer of our permanent exhibit. This was from 1970. Seven. It was a a really fun exhibit to do on campus to for current students to, to realize a slice of Bethel's history. And then during the summer, during our summer camps, um, we brought out our historic bikes from our collection to make a display during the pedal power bike camp. And then one of those bikes represented the museum in the Harvey County Parade where it it uh, garnered us a third place award. <laughs> this coming spring, in 2022, we're mounting an exhibit uh, featuring or celebrating 125 years of having a museum at Bethel College. And we're soliciting ideas from the public. If you haven't, Submitted your idea, your favorite, your object you'd like us to bring out of storage and exhibit for that exhibit. Fill that out. You got it with, members got it with their ballot, and I think you have until October 3 to send that in. Already the exhibit promises to be um, engaging, interesting, and I know it will already feature our largest object in the collection, and also one of our oldest cultural artifacts, along with many, many other interesting items. We're grateful for all the individuals and family groups that have, both this year and in decades past, who have chosen Kauf Museum as a place where their artifacts can enrich all of our collective life. Thank you. This past year has been um, a really interesting trip for Coffin Museum's traveling exhibits. With the museum closing to the public during the pandemic, we feared that this, what this would do to our exhibits on the road. Two of our exhibits were installed or partially installed only to be closed and eventually packed up and shipped on. Um, the Voices of Conscience was installed in Freeman, South Dakota to coincide with their annual Schmeckfest. Dave went and set it up. Uh, it was a really interesting installation uh, in their historic church building. They'd taken the pews out and arrayed, set it up so the chairs so that it could host the exhibit, and they had a lot of programming planned for it. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, Schmeckfest was canceled and the exhibit was closed soon after it was set up, eventually shipped back to Coffin Museum. Another booking following that at Tabor College in Hillsborough was also postponed. Um, we were able to complete one installation in Montezuma, Kansas at the Stout Memorial Museum, yet this, uh, in the spring of this year. Both the Freeman and Hillsborough bookings are rescheduled for the spring of 2022. Um, another exhibit that Coffin Museum travels, which we are instrumental in, in building with uh, Flint Hills Design over 10 years ago, we now travel on behalf of the National Buffalo Foundation. Um, <clears throat> the first booking at the start of the pandemic 
at, in Pendleton, Oregon, at an Indian Native American cultural uh, institution, had to be canceled after they just started setting it up. But the rest of the trip uh, was able to continue with a slightly shifted schedule, and bookings continued through two venues in Texas, and then up to Kansas, to the Boot Hill Museum in Dodge City, uh, then to the Dane G. Hansen Museum, and here is a, a video that they put together at the Dane G. Hansen Museum uh, of the installation. So that gives you some idea of, of the kind of thing that Dave and I do. It usually takes about uh, six to eight hours to do what you saw there in a minute. <clears throat> Following that installation, uh, Austin came and helped me move it to the Coronado Quivero Museum in Lyons, and the exhibit is now installed uh, in at the Santa Fe Trail Center in Larned, Kansas. <clears throat> We brought the Sorting Out Race exhibit back to Kauffman Museum for the fall of 2020. Uh, the exhibit was incorporated into a number of Bethel classes and was a, a real resource to the college community. Uh, the exhibit then traveled to Salt Lake City, a very installation there at a museum called the Leonardo Museum, which is somewhat of a science uh, history, uh, I mean science uh, exploration museum. Um, <clears throat> The Leonardo partnered there with the Utah Black Chamber, allowing for a wide range of programming, and uh, the exhibit being well received, the original two-month booking was extended for another two months. Uh, the, a diverse range of programs included not only many school groups, but also some corporate businesses used it for diversity training for their employees. <clears throat> I should also say that uh, we are working now with MCC Thrift to uh, look at a tour over the next few years going around specifically to MCC Thrift Stores. They were partners in the production of the exhibit initially and are interested in seeing that it gets to more of their, um, <clears throat> more of their locations. Uh, this is an exhibit that is, that is timely with the uh, uh, pertinent and has a lot of interest. Another one, which we brought out of storage, is the Climate and Energy Central, another exhibit that Coffin Museum produced uh, in collaboration with Flintills Design, this one for uh, NSF-funded science being done in Kansas to tell their story. So uh, earlier this week, we loaded it on a truck. I helped Dave load it, and he headed out to Logan, Kansas, where you saw the video earlier of the install of the bison exhibit. Uh, Here's the installation in Logan. You might notice some similarities. Uh, this is built around the same system that the bison exhibit used. And uh, you can actually, the, the basic system there is, is marketed by Flint Hills Design as bison crates. <clears throat> this exhibit we're planning to promote for an extensive, a more extensive tour across Kansas considering um, both the pertinence of this topic as well, looking at climate change and energy. Um, yeah, so in terms of promotion, we like to keep exhibits on the road. One of our other exhibits, which will go on the road, but is now installed at Kauff Museum uh, on, on vapes, on vaping, 
Austin prepared a presentation on this, and before I start his presentation, I'll just mention that um, background to this exhibit, but with Michael, our previous director before um, Andy, and then also Cole, a student, or uh, an intern that we had working here, did a lot of work getting this going. Michael had the vision after seeing the Better Choose Me exhibit installed here to, do, to, to look at another related issue 100 years after the beginning of tobacco advertising. Uh, and Cole did a lot of the research and, and original groundwork for this. Uh, so now, here's Austin. Hi everyone, I'm Austin Prouty, Exhibition Assistant at Kaufman Museum. And I'm not able to join you in person today because I recently returned to California to continue working on my master's degree. Um, but I've worked with Kaufman Museum for over the past year, the majority of that time being in person, and then over the past week or so um, working remotely. A clear highlight of my time at Kaufman Museum has been um, the planning and fabrication and production of our newest exhibit, Vapes, Marketing and Addiction. Um, this exhibit explores the use of new techniques and contemporary platforms in marketing nicotine to a new demographic. The Vapes exhibit consists of three modules and design and production of these was carried out primarily by Chuck and I. Aesthetic inspiration for these modules comes from research we did into the sales of vapes and e-liquid, and unit one of the exhibit is centered around a glass display case showing sample products for sale like you might find in an actual vape shop. Unit two consists of a label rail, two video components showing both vintage tobacco ads and modern forms of marketing, and an interactive light up clear acrylic timeline tracking various nicotine and tobacco related metrics over the past century. And finally, Unit 3 is designed around a desk that facilitates viewer response and tells the story of STAND, a local organization that advocated for the raising of the minimum tobacco purchase age to 21 in the Newton community in order to lower youth tobacco consumption. The design and production of vapes utilized Adobe Illustrator to plant physical exhibit components, but also broke some exciting new ground for the museum. Because this exhibit involves multiple transparent and translucent elements and can also be paired with Kaufman Museum's Better Choose Me exhibit, we utilize 3D modeling software to test how some of these various components would work together, see how the various elements might be laid out in our own temporary exhibit space and at our first installation venue, NMC Health. Back in the physical world, a significant amount of research went into the LED lit clear acrylic timeline panels with some exciting developments being made in the dispersion of light through the clear panels and the highlighting of opaque surfaces on those panels, which are used to cool effect here, but also have some exciting possibilities beyond this exhibit. Production and assembly took place in the museum shop with several test pieces and then all of the final acrylic pieces being cut on the CNC machine at Flint Hills Design. Probably one of the newest directions that this exhibit took Kaufman Museum in was the in-house production of the four video components, two of which required creation of totally bespoke content. This was something that multiple people collaborated on, um, with me taking the lead on conducting interviews, uh, recording and editing the video, and creating the digital animations, and Rachel Panabecker helping to provide some great feedback on direction and editing. The end result for the Vapes Unit 1 module was a nearly six minute animation exploring nicotine's addictive properties. It's a mixture that typically contains water, a choice of nicotine levels, food grade flavoring in thousands of combinations, PG or propylene glycol to provide the throat hit similar to cigarettes and boost the flavor, and VG or vegetable glycerin that is easier on the throat than PG and produces a thick vape cloud. The Unit 2 video components supplement the interactive timeline and flipbook with an iPad showing vintage tobacco ads and an iPhone showing examples of vaping advertising on social media. And finally, for Unit 3, five interviews I conducted with four local high school students and their coordinator came together as an 11-minute video chronicling their impact, personal experience, and motivations in being an activist in their local community. STAND is a youth-led organization in the community in Harvey County and also slowly reaching in Marion County. There's high school organizations, um, there are clubs some places and they're just um, extracurriculars other places, um, but we do have organizations in 
Halstead, Newton, Heston, Sedgwick, Peabody, and Burton. Uh, that is focused on using young people and youth as a resource in the community. Right, that's a little bit from Austin, and thank you very much, Austin, for joining us from far away. Uh, to close, I wanted to tell you about just a few things uh, that we're looking forward to in the next year, and just uh, in a few, uh, even some even in the months ahead. Uh, there will be continued vapes programming. Uh, stay tuned for the dates on those. We're confirming uh, dates and speakers right now, and. Of course, uh, coming up very soon is Fall Festival at Bethel College, and we will have a program here, in addition to being open and having a booth at a Taste of Newton and a booth on campus, we'll have a program here at 1.30 on Saturday, and that will be Lauren Friesen, and Lauren Friesen will be talking about the Dutch Golden Age and uh, Mennonites' relation in society uh, to society as a whole at that time. So 1.30, that have, we'll have reservations to be in this room. And then also, again, uh, we're hoping to have it live streamed and recorded on that one. So that's October 2 at 1.30. And uh, Dave has already mentioned KM125. That's the Kaufman Museum 125th anniversary of a, Bethel, of a museum at Bethel College. And that will be opening in the spring, and so we're looking forward to that. There have been lots of work already on that exhibit. And then I want to make sure you all know about an upcoming event. We have October 23, our annual Living Endowment Dinner. We're hoping you can join us for that. You may, re you may remember that last year we had an event where you could drive up, uh, pick up your meals, or we would deliver them to your house. And we're going to do something similar to that. Uh, in anticipation of the 125th anniversary, we're going to be looking back at the turn of the last century, and our meal will have a bit of a Victorian theme to it, sort of turn of the last century. So we're excited to collaborate with um, Eldersley Farm again on that meal. So stay tuned for information about that for October 23. And with that, I, uh, well, I guess I'll stop and see if there are any questions, either online there or from anyone that's here in the building. Okay, then I'll give the mic back to Donna. Well, what, a, what an interesting and informative uh, hour this has been. Thank you. Uh, for those of you that are here in the auditorium and those of you that have joined us online and uh, I think uh, we just we just hit five o'clock so we did really well keeping this to an hour and uh, I want to just thank you again for coming and wish you uh, a good evening and we are dismissed